I hope we can rejoice and be glad in it. The word of the Lord has been read. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for your presence in our midst. Thank you for your promise that your word will not come back to you empty because you will always prosper it in our hearts. Here we are. We have come as we are to worship you, to praise you, and to receive your message. Oh God, you know our hearts. Bless us. Bless us because we need you. In Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of you have a to-do or pending things, things to do list? How many of you? Yes, some of us have. I have. Actually, I have more than one list. I have several lists. I have a list for my family. Birthdays, doctor appointments, um, remembering anniversaries, whatever is in the family circle. I have one for things that I need to do or want to do during the summer. At the beginning of the summer, the summer looks so long, right? And we say, now the summer is the time to do all these things I have been waiting for. Now this is the middle of the summer, and I'm still having my list, my things to do during the summer. I don't know if I will mark, check all of those that I have in the list. I have a list for church. When I am preaching, when is this pastor parish committee meeting, where is the, when are the English classes beginning, you know, church things, at least for the church. And a general thing of just things to do. The thing, the reality is that I am sure we all have lists because lists are good, supposedly they help us not to forget, right? One of the reasons that we make the list, that we write the list, is that we don't want to forget. I want to be sure that I don't forget to make this call. You know, I have to call this person or pay this bill that came last week and I have to pay or I am overdue. The list help us not to forget. Hopefully, hopefully the list also help us to prioritize the things that we need to do. Something that we don't always do. The other day, somebody asked me to write a small article, but the subject that they were asking me, it was not one of my favorite subjects. It was a difficult subject. I had to do research. And I put it in the list, you know, and I had a, a, a due date to submit the article. But what happened was, because I really didn't like that much, that task, I kept doing everything else in the list except the article that I had to write. The most important thing in the list, I didn't do it. Because the reality is that sometimes we just go around and around doing so many things, right? And at the end, we discover that really we didn't have to do all those things. That the best thing is to begin with the important things. Once we begin with important things, we discover that whatever else we had in the list, they were not really important. They, they take our time, they take our energy, and they, they could wait. But hopefully they at least help us to prioritize, although so many times we don't, and keep going around and around and around. And, we, and the reality is that we need lists. Lists are not bad. I'm not advocating against the list. I have a, <laughs> several lists, as I told you. But the, the thing is that we, are, we need the list because we are busy. We live in a busy society, right? Everybody is busy. We are so busy that sometimes you find people in the, in the street or in the elevator. You say, good morning, how are you? And they don't even answer and they keep on going. Sometimes we get to the point that, um, that how are you doing? Somebody, the answer is, oh, I have been sick. And you tell, oh, how good? And you continue because you really, 
didn't listen, right? We are so busy that we just do things automatically, but we are not really present, right? We are not fully present. And that's one of the, the, the things that worries me so much. That sometimes I'm not present in today because I'm so busy preparing for the future, right? A friend of mine the other day was, uh, came to me very consternated. She said, today is my daughter's birthday. And I said, oh, how good are you planning? What are you planning for her? I said, I forgot that today is my daughter's birthday, and she is in New York, and I didn't send a car, I, didn't, I haven't called her, because I forgot, I have been so busy preparing the family reunion in October that I was not present for my daughter today. That has happened to you? That has happened to me many times. We are so busy planning, and in the church, we do it a lot. <laughs> we, we get plans, and we are planning for the activities in September and October, and that has happened to me, and then, all of a sudden, I say, hey, come back. This is July. This is July, and living in October, and living in November, when, but what happens today? Am I present today? I am fully living today? That's, that's the, the thing. Uh, now, another friend came to me because her blood pressure went up like that. She was very, she's healthy, she is well, she walks, and sometimes she even runs, so she does, she's doing the right things. She's doing the right things. But her blood pressure went up all so much that she went to the doctor. And the doctor, well, the doctor checked her blood, uh, blood tests, uh, all those, you know, all those tests that you have to do when you go to the physical. And uh, everything was okay, except the blood pressure was high. And the doctor began to ask, well, tell me about yourself, tell me about your life. And she began to tell her all the things she was doing. She supervised so many people, and she had people who worked with her, and she coordinated this, and she had planning this, and she was this and that, and this and that. And the doctor closed her ear and said, what happens to you is that you are so busy. You have to develop a trusting heart. And she said, a trusting heart? What is a trusting heart? A heart that trust that the people that work with you are going to do their job. That they have as much knowledge as you have, that's why you hire them, right? And that's why they are in those positions. You have to trust that the things that you plan together are going to happen. You have to trust that things will fall on their place. You have to trust your feelings. You have to trust your capacity. You have to trust that you are not the only one. That there are many people doing, that you are working together. You have to learn to relax. Take your medicines, do what you have to do, but also trust and relax, relax, because you are not in control. You are not the one in control. Our society is very busy. And we live in a busy society, and the doctors, the psychologists' offices are full of people who are feeling depressed, anxious, because they are so tense, right? And what happens in our heart, what happens in our spirit, affects our body. Because the reality is that we are an, an unit. Paul, St. Paul said to the church, that the church is similar to the body, that when one member suffers, the whole body suffers. That, uh, Paul was talking about the church reflecting the body, and sometimes we forget that, that our body is one unit, and when we, our mind is so full that it gets tired, the whole body is tired. When our heart is hurt, the whole body is hurt. Because the body is mind and body and, and heart and emotions and feelings and thinking. And we have to learn how to trust. We have to learn what the beloved doctor of the New Testament, Luke, 
the passage that we read, learn listening to Jesus. Luke is known as the beloved doctor of the New Testament. And that's why in the Gospel of Luke, he emphasizes Jesus' teaching about taking time for yourself, taking time to go away. It looks so when Jesus, in the midst of all the demands and all the questions, Jesus heal me, and Jesus do this, and Jesus do that. What did Jesus do? Do you remember? What did Jesus do at those times? Everybody wanted Jesus. He went away. He went away to pray, to quiet down, to claim himself. And look, saw Jesus sharing with friends, having good time with the, with the people that he loved, healing, preaching, but also when the times got too bad, when Jesus was very tired, he took time to cry and to pray and to be alone because he knew that he had to trust the one in control. And the one in control is our God. That's when Jesus told the people, the disciples, you know, I see you so worried about what you are going to eat and what you're going to dress and what you're going to do tomorrow. All the things that they were worried and we're worried about today too. And he said, you remember, he made a story. He said, this was, there was this man who was so busy and so concerned about saving money. Saving so that he could have money, enough resources for the children, for his house, and then for a good retirement. Like we all do. We are we want to be sure that we have enough to eat, enough to dress, enough for our children, enough to go to the hospital, and enough at the time that we are retired. And Jesus said, and this man was so concentrated that he worked and worked and worked and worked, didn't do anything else. At the time that he was ready to enjoy all his things, the Lord said, you know, tonight, Tonight is the night that you are going to be in my presence. <laughs> and what happened with all the things that he kept, he worked for? Jesus said, you know, look at the birds, look at the lilies. And he chose a bird that the people in Palestine didn't like that much. He chose the raven because the raven was an unclean bird. And, and you know how important it was for the Jewish people, clean and unclean. And then Jesus, to tell them about the one in control, tells them, look at the ravens, that bird that you don't like. Yet, the raven has to eat, has something to eat. God is taking care of the ravens. And if God takes care of the ravens, how don't you think that God is not going to take care of you? Of you that are God's child. Because you are God's child. You are God's children. You are important. So if God takes care of the birds. And look at the lilies, beautiful lilies. So beautiful, right, that we use them in Easter, and they is one of the most beautiful flowers. And yet Jesus said the lily doesn't worry about what they're going to dress because God takes care of them. God takes care of them. Remember that God is in control, Jesus said. God is the one in control. And he's telling us today, in the midst of a busy society full of tensions and anxiety, let us remember that God is in control. Now, Jesus is not telling us not to do anything. Jesus is not telling us that if, if I, that I don't need to work, I don't need to do anything, that everything is going to come to me just because God will send it to me. Is Jesus saying that? No. He said, you do your part. You do what you're supposed to do, and the rest, leave it to God. Leave it to God. 
You are not in control of creation. God is in control of creation. You trust in the God who made creation, who made heaven and earth. You don't have to worry about the, the earth going around the sun. Right? Do we have to worry about that? We don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about my lungs breathing or my stomach doing what it has to do for digestion. I trust that the laws of the one who did such a perfect body and a perfect creation are going to continue working. I'm going to do my part. And the rest, I leave it to God. The one who is in control. The one who is in control. Did you know that you are important? That God loves you so much. Did you know that? Because sometimes we forget. Even though we come to church and we are Christians, I don't know about you, but sometimes in the midst of a problem or in the midst of so many things to do, I forget. I live and act like I didn't have a God who loved me who can supply my needs, who has helped my limitations. That what I cannot do, God will do it for me. When I don't have strength enough, God will give me the strength I need to go through whatever. Amen. When I don't have the wisdom to decide, God will help me and will give me the wisdom I need to make decisions for my life. Because God loves us. And that was the prophet Hosea, the prophet of love, was telling in the scripture that we read earlier to the Israel people. The Israel people were in a situation in Assyria, captive in Assyria, and the situation was going to be worse. They were captive. They were sad. They were crying. And through the prophet, the prophet calls them to repent and says, you are here. This is the consequence of your sin, of your disobedience. But in spite of your disobedience, in spite of your sins, God loves you so much, people of Israel, that God will bring you back to freedom. What a beautiful thing. You have been bad. <laughs> that what... The prophet was saying, you have been bad. But you know what? God loves you so much that he will not let you cry. He will not let you exile. He will bring you back to freedom. Trust God. Develop a trusting heart. Do we have a trusting heart? Are we able to leave everything in God's hands? Are we able to really trust? Trusting her is having a relationship with God, an intimate relationship with God. Because when we are in relationship with Jesus, when we walk with Jesus, we can then know that Jesus is here with us, present with us. When we are in that relationship, we can do what Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. And everything else will fall in place. What, is it, what does it mean to be seek first the kingdom of God? To live in that relationship. To live in the values of the kingdom. And our kingdom, the kingdom of God, is a different kingdom. It's the kingdom of life. Life that overcomes death. Life that overcomes depression. Life that be overcomes anxiety. Life that overcomes sickness. Life that overcomes loneliness. Because God supplies our limitations. God does. I'm sure you have experienced that in your life many times. I have experienced it. That I have been given a... Uh, something to do that I do it with hesitation and then all of a sudden I'm the first one surprised that I did it so well but it was not me it was God supplying what I needed what I lack 
because I was in a relationship with God. When we are in a relationship with God, when we try to live in the kingdom, we can trust. We can have a trusting heart. Carl Jung, a psychologist, had in his office a sign, a sign that was the words of Erasmo, Desiderio Erasmo, now he was a theologian in the Middle Ages. But the, the words are so crucial to remember. He said, uninvited or not, invited or God, and invited, uninvited or not, that means invited or not, uninvited or not, God is always present. We may invite God, we may disinvite God, God is there. God is present. God is present in our life. Let us not forget that. And my invitation to you and to me because you know the preachers preach to themselves, to all of us, is there is a lot to do. We live in a busy society. There are tensions, and sometimes the temptation is to be part of that and keep doing, 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 doing. My invitation is that we stop, and we strengthen our relationship with God, that we come back to God, and we may hear his voice again saying, you are my child. I love you even before you were born. Do not worry so much. Do not worry so much because I am with you. Because I love you. And all you have to do is to open your heart, to have a trusting heart, knowing that God, our wonderful and loving God, will and is taking care of you. Amen.